Our first reading this morning is Luke chapter 6, verses 43 to 47, from the message by Eugene Peterson. You don't get wormy apples off a healthy tree, nor good apples off a diseased tree. The health of the apple tells the health of the tree. You must begin with your own life-giving lives. It's who you are, not what you say and do that counts. Your true being brims over into true words and deeds. Why are you so polite with me, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, sir, but never doing a thing that I tell you? These words I speak to you are not mere additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words, words to build a life on. And then Richard Rohr writes in The Universal Christ, For the planet and for all living beings to move forward, we can rely on nothing less than an, an inherent original goodness and universally shared dignity. Only then can we build, because the foundation is strong and is itself good. This is surely what Jesus meant when he told us to dig and dig deep and build your house on a rock. When you start with a yes or a positive vision, you more, you more likely proceed with generosity and hope, and you have a much greater chance of ending with an even bigger yes to try and build on no is the in the imagery of Jesus is to build on sand. For literally decades now, this congregation has been known for its non-dogma. A non-dogmatic approach to religion and spirituality. I dare say it's even a matter of pride. I'm certainly proud of it. It forms the opening line of our covenant here together that though we may not agree on every single little thing, we do in fact agree to, quote, live out the questions together hand in hand, supporting the fragile, protecting the wounded, giving the angered space and time, dancing with the free, and after last Sunday, I might say, having fun, <laughs> celebrating the moments of balance and not fearing the unfolding of the imbalance. There are certain streams of Christianity and Christian theology that would consider this to be heresy. And if that's the case, I just want to say how much I love heresy, <clears throat> how much I enjoy it, how freeing and how life-giving it is, and just how much it makes me say yes in a world of no. Speaking of the world of no, we are at this fever pitch, of course, of dualism and binary thinking that seems to have kidnapped everything that is involved in our public discourse and our national psyche. And I think that we're all here today to commit ourselves to dialing that down just a little bit, because if we don't dial it down, we're not going to be able to heal ourselves, let alone our planet. Confident assertions of certainty 
always get us into trouble. Because they fail to take in the very creative and evolutionary core of who we are, who God is, and the rationale we have for being on the planet Earth in the first place. Some of you here today can probably remember John Mabry. John Mabry is a UCC minister who uh, used to serve in the East Bay. He now lives in the capital region of New York State, near Albany. And he was here at CCC for a seminar during your interim with Irene. And that seminar was based on his book, Faithful Generations. Fascinating work eye-opening work. He has another book, at least another, probably several others, but another book called Heretics, Mystics, and Misfits. And I love that book. I was reading it as we were preparing to make our way to California. It's based on a series of sermons that he preached and delivered several years ago, and each chapter highlights a person or a group of people who in the history of the Christian faith have been criticized and ostracized and exiled and occasionally burned at the stake for daring to live out the questions in ways that the religion of empire disapproved. People like Pelagius, Meister Eckhart, Julian of Norwich, George Fox, Hegel, Kierkegaard, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. It's a longer list than that. I remember reading this book and being so excited and also finding my way into relaxing into the idea of being a heretic and loving it. Realizing that in a sense, I've always been a heretic, whether I could admit it or not. And then you get to a certain age where you don't care who knows it. And it's a lovely place to be. Now, I do want to clarify this by saying that John Mabry is using the word heretic in a very tongue-in-cheek sort of way. He means it as a compliment. He means it as a positive. But there are thousands of theologians from the fourth century onward who have joined in lockstep to decide what is right for everybody, rejecting sacred writings of many genres and many histories, insisting that God is only masculine, And then any deviation from that pure masculine character of God amounts to sin that angers him. And then they've taken this idea of an angry male deity to an extreme that says we're all sinners because we sin all kinds of sins. But more importantly, we sin because we're sinners by our very nature since Adam did the unthinkable thing by listening to his wife and eating an apple from the wrong tree. (laughs) This concept of original sin has made it possible for the religion of empire to convince many of us that we cannot live without them. And then we must have some sort of mediated settlement with this angry male God. And since they're the experts on who God is, they will magnanimously show us the way. Really? Having a Seth Meyers moment right now. Really? 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 Most everyone has been listening to my incessant chatter about our newest grandson, born a month ago today, born a month early, everybody's fine. We soon will pay him a visit. But in the meantime, his proud papa, who's a first time dad, texts me a a photo or 30 a day 
<laughs> Every time I stare at that little face, I, found, I find myself just a teeny bit more, no, a lot more hopeful about the direction of the world. And here's the funny thing. When I look into his eyes, I don't feel like I'm looking into the eyes of a sinner <laughs> who is offensive to God. Quite the opposite. I feel like I'm looking into the eyes of the divine. My heart opens wide. I can only feel the energy of yes. Say it with me. Yes. yes. I can only feel the energy of yes. I don't see any of the limitations of no. Our young ones enter this world in yes. It's just yes. It's all yes. Until we get a hold of them and, you know, work on the no. When I look at these little ones, all little ones, everywhere, I become even more convinced of what Matthew Fox calls original blessing. Embodied before my very eyes, and it washes away any residue of original sin. Over the centuries, we've been sold the myth of certainty and that this certainty, supposed certainty, gives us a sure foundation, a body of dogma that can never change. And that everything else, all of you woo-woo people out there, everything else is just shifting sand. But Richard Rohr, in all of his books, but especially The Universal Christ, argues that the opposite is actually true. He says, we can rely on nothing less than an inherent original goodness and a universally shared dignity. Only then can we build because the foundation is strong and is itself good. Jesus said that it's who we are, not what we do or don't do that matters. It's at the core of our being. It's the essence of everything that we call divine. It's love that animates everything in the universe, every animal, vegetable, mineral, every human soul. You can't look into the subatomic world and find any evil contained therein. It does not stop people from choosing to do evil things with that energy, but the energy itself is not evil, and the same is true of our souls. People twist this idea of divinity into the most elaborate contortions, and it's usually in the furtherance of their own aims, usually having something to do with power or domination or making some people the others. But even then, even they are not in their essence evil people. They've just lost sight of who they really are and they've made themselves or tried to make themselves into something that they are not. And when you live like that, you're building your house on sand. If you can get to the inherent goodness within the human soul, you find there a foundation to build upon that is solid as the rock out here on the corner of our lot. The only thing I talk about more than my grandchildren is the fact that we are in a new reformation. That's my other broken record. That the entire culture, the entire world, it's not just the church, it's not just religion. We're in a time of reformation. It's been brewing, we've been talking about it, we've been living through it for years kind of came to our doorstep the day that the internet made itself known to us. 
And from then on, it's just been a mass of information and influence and social media. And if we were dragging our feet at all, along came a pandemic and gave us every reason to drop what we were doing and go in the direction of something new. One of our more famous congregationalist forebears, his name was Jonathan Edwards. Maybe you've heard of him. Living in the first half of the 18th century, he's noted for that famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I'd read it in literature class in high school. Interesting. We look at that now and we think, wow, that is a real relic. It's language we would never use. It wasn't such a hellfire brimstone sermon, by the way. Uh, accounts written at that time say that he was very quiet and very dry in his delivery. But with the weight of his words, he was able to impress upon people the kind of guilt that had them quaking on the floor. I don't envision that for us today. But the, the thing about Jonathan Edwards that I, I really love when I re-examine all of that is how he was in the flow of the Enlightenment and that he was one of the catalysts for the First Great Awakening and how centuries before when Martin Luther in Germany was a great reformer of the church, the Reformation didn't end there. It's always reforming. And that Reformation took us through the first and second great awakenings. It's taken us through the entire history of our country. It's taken us really through the entire history of our world. And here we are, every once in a while, we'll have a great awakening and then we'll decide, okay, this is, this is the end. This is how it is. Okay, we're going to write this all down and we're going to make everybody do this now. Until we find out that the evolution just keeps going. It keeps evolving. And the one thing I can say about this congregation is that we have learned how to evolve. We, I say it proudly, I hopefully not sinfully proudly, just proudly proudly, that you've always been ahead of the curve here. That covenant proves it to me. So what I would say to us today is let's stay ahead of the curve. Let's not, let's not take what we have and nail it to the floor so that we can always have it just the way that we want. The old paradigms, even our old paradigms, are falling away as new ones come into view. John Philip Newell sat in this very spot a few years ago and said, we are the midwives of a new creation. We aren't quite sure what's trying to be born, but the labor pains are evident. So I say, if that's heresy, let's just bring it on. You can spend your whole life building something from nothing. One storm can come and blow it all away. Build it anyway. You can chase a dream that seems so out of reach. And you know it might not ever come your way. Dream it anyway. 
God is great, but sometimes life ain't good. And I'm well. it should but I do it anyway I do it anyway this world's gone crazy and it's hard to believe that tomorrow will be better than today Believe it anyway. You can love someone with all your heart for all the right reasons. And in a moment, they can choose to walk away. Love them anyway. But sometimes life ain't good And when I pray It doesn't always turn out like I think it should But I do it anyway I do it anyway You can pour your soul out singing a song that you believe in, that tomorrow they'll forget you ever sang. Sing it anyway. I sing, I dream.